Good evening. Uh, tonight is Tuesday, August 14, 2018. Pat's standing up already. He's ready to go. Uh, welcome to uh, our city council meeting. Clerk, will you read the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Council members Brecky? Erickson? Here. Kylie? Here. Neitzert? Here. Selberg? Here. Soul? Here. Star? Here. Staley? Here. Thank you. Uh, we are all here. We will now move to our uh, invocation pledge of allegiance. And for that tonight, we are honored to have uh, Reverend Brett Best with us, who is the Reverend at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And I already told him with a name like Brett Best, he's got heck of a uh, uh, name to live up to with his invocation here. So, uh, <laughs> oh my God. Uh, so we will rise for that invocation and then we'll stay standing for the pledge of allegiance after that. So, Reverend Best. As we are observing VJ Day, let's take a moment for silence and then I'll lead you in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, And I would ask to get a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay, Second, Kylie. Uh, any discussion on that? Okay, S seeing none, I would ask you a roll call vote, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Silver? Yes. Staley? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. That has passed 8 to 0. And we will now move on to our regular agenda for the evening. Move to approve Erickson. Second, Kylie. Approve Erickson, second. Councilor, Councilor Kylie, any discussion on that? If not, a roll call vote on that, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? That has also passed, 8 to 0. Uh, now we'll move into the public input portion of our meeting. Uh, I'd like to point out that the recent changes to our city ordinance provide for three minutes for public input for all regular agenda items. So additionally, the public input portion at the beginning of the meeting will last no more than 30 minutes. And because public input for all regular agenda items will be taken, you're asked to limit your public input to topics not appearing later on the agenda because we can speak to those uh, later in the evening. So uh, at this time, I'd like to invite members of the public forward for public input. And uh, please note that the official time right now is um, 7.04. Talking to your microphone, Bob Colby, Sioux Falls, originally from Sleepy Eye, Minnesota. This is chapter two, and I'll go over it quickly. The front of the Missouri River, the Missouri River was the outwash for the glacier after 10,000 years ago. The uh, Sioux River was the connection between the glacier as it flowed, as the water flowed south into the Missouri River. As the flow reduced in force, it dropped its load of sand and gravel, which gives us the Sioux Aquifer, which is anywhere from toward a mile wide to upwards of 60 feet deep. We experienced a, an oil spill on the pipeline up at Sorum's Corner or the Renner Corner about 25 years ago. That was about 400,000 gallons of product. 
Uh, they used to check the line by flying over it with an airplane, and if stuff was bubbling up, they knew they had a leak. They've changed a bit since. We were, uh, the state decided to go after a civil suit against Williams Pipeline because a criminal suit, the, uh, the fine was $1,000. The civil suit was to get something that would benefit the citizenry of Minneapolis County, City, Sioux Falls, and the state of South Dakota. We listened to EPA. EPA said, be a joint force. Don't let the, uh, them try to separate somebody out because they'll go for the weak fish and try to kill that, and then you have nothing going for you. We met. We uh, decided we wanted a pipe in a pipe to come on the Sioux Aquifer from the west side of the aquifer to the east side of the aquifer so that we could protect the aquifer. We worked at that. There was the Minnehaha uh, Conservation District, the Dirt and Water, the AG's office, Minnehaha County, the uh, City of Sioux Falls, and maybe one other entity. We were meeting. We were making progress. We had met with the people down in Tulsa. They tried to impress us on how good they were. Then one day we were called down to the Black Watch for a, conf uh, a the mayor was going to issue some kind of statement. The mayor, Gary Hansen, had settled with Williams Pipeline and that killed the entire operation of any kind of protection for the aquifer. We've all gone on to bigger and better things. We've live, lived on a borrowed time as far as the potential of the pipeline and its puncture or release of product. Now, do you think there's ever going to be a pipe in a pipe under the Missouri River? Well, we have not had that protection because the mayor did not counsel with any of the other entities that were involved and settled with Williams Pipeline, and we could have been better off. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Good evening, Scott. Hi, I'm Scott Harris from Sioux Falls. <clears throat> I want to say that um, I'm very disappointed in the fact that we did uh, cut our ties with legacy. As this project moves ahead, um, every time something comes up with the, the government's investigation, federal lawsuits, Legacy will be brought up every single time That's while we're building this project. Now, some say it would be impossible to get rid of Legacy throughout litigation, but I think there's a lot the government can do without spending a dime. Um, it's unfortunate that we have no idea what money is, what part of it they own. We have no idea um, what commission they're taking. And we continue to allow them to be a part of this, even though Jeff Lamont may be running the show, Legacy is still going to be getting tax dollars in some way, shape, or form in the form of a commission or something. This is unfortunate. And we should find a way to cut our ties with this completely and make this a Lamont project and a journey project and not anything to do with legacy whatsoever. Um, it is not good for tax money of any kind to go towards someone like this that is being uh, investigated for these things. And we keep stumbling over ourselves and we keep allowing this to continue. And it's time to just bite the bullet and stop it. Another topic, I find it kind of ironic that we were concerned with the whole public input debate about somebody saying potty words in the chambers. And recently we were gonna fund riot gear for the police department in case someone got out of troll with protests. But did you know, nobody has mentioned that anybody can walk into the chambers here with a concealed weapon and it's perfectly legal. No one's complained about that. No one's ever said anything about that. No one's ever challenged the state legislature about this. I think it's insane that we can allow people to bring firearms into a public meeting. They can't bring them into the courthouse, 
but they can walk into here or City Hall with a concealed weapon. Doesn't that worry you a little bit? Worries me quite a bit. But we're worried about whether or not someone used a dirty word in these chambers, but we're not too concerned about people being able to bring a loaded weapon into this chamber. You know, I haven't been here for a while, and one of the reasons is because of some of the people that come up here, they do worry me a little bit. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Hi, Bruce. Bruce Danielson, Sioux Falls. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to ask you, as somebody who has a hearing deficit, that bring the microphones up to you when you talk, because standing in the back of the room, I can't hear you even with the PA system. So hmm. I just want you to know that these are omnidirectional uh, microphones, and they you have to speak directly into them in order for people to actually hear you. So it would, last meeting was excruciating for me, and I wanted to mention it. Thanks. Uh, on Friday, I called the uh, a city director's office and to talk about a couple of situations that I ran into that I actually, uh, it involves potholes. And I watched uh, two men that were working out on West 12th Street almost get slammed into because they were out there working on the potholes and they were so involved, they didn't see that they almost got run over. And that was, that something needs to be done about the way that they do these potholes and they have to be thinking about safety and I wanted this director to know that I spotted this and I was gonna witness the mowing down of these two individuals and I wasn't very happy about seeing that. The other thing was uh, up at the, uh, on North Lewis, uh, and 31st, it's kind of a neighborhood that, that we have some individuals in the back of the room here that are very concerned about cleaning up that neighborhood. And I drive through that neighborhood on a very regular basis in the work I do. And I saw a situation up there for about six months now where there's this monster pothole. The neighbors have actually gone out and tried to fill it themselves with gravel. And I was... Moments after I had been on West 12th Street, there were three of us that were trying to get around that pothole and two of them almost collided. Uh, I wasn't one of those, I was another witness to that. And I, I just felt like I needed to talk to this director and to this point, I've not heard anything yet and when I called into that office, the person that answered the phone chewed me out for being involved in potholes. I didn't think that was a very smart thing to do and it just kinda, you can tell I'm still kinda ticked off about it and I would like to see something done about the safety there and the safety in monster potholes. Thank you. Bruce will make a note of that. North Lewis and 31st Street pothole. I'll check on that. So, thank you. Hi, Sierra. Sierra Bruce, at Sioux Falls. So, on Saturday, the police made arrests at the massage parlors. This was going on for years. People came up here and said that they were racist. Not only massage parlors, massage therapists was complaining, but the citizens were complaining. The owners of this massage parlor are attorneys. So we're gonna see how this is gonna play out. When they got arrested on Saturday, the Monday they still opened up, not licensed, which they got a class A misdemeanor on. ISIS is involved investigation and there was no human trafficking but possible prostitution. Now I have contacted the owners, let the owners know that an eviction process needs to be started on these people. I will send a decoy in there if they open up their doors illegally again to get up on prostitution. Second of all, when we do ride-alongs, we don't need and I don't need to be advised by the city uh, attorney's office of my do's and my don'ts. When we did the first ride-along tour last year, the people that are selling their properties that are slumlords had told us that we can enter on the property. They have also said we can call court enforcement and we can call the health department to come on this property anytime. That was a recorded conversation that I still have on my phone. 
Come to find out he didn't like it when the city came down on him, now he's selling his property. There's another property going up for sale that was a problematic property that's going up for sale too on September the 1st. We will keep doing these right alongs and addressing this to the city until we can actually do something with high crime areas and high crime properties. There is one property that has been investigated with HUD fraud. I'm not going to get into details with it, but these people needs to be taken down. And when you are going to put people into a building for six, six, twenty, seven hundred, doesn't mean that you have to put them in a hole in the wall and have all kind of code violations, health violations, and police contact through the roof that the owner could have managed on it. Getting back to the police department with the riot gear, yes, absolutely. And I said this time and time again before the police had damn body cameras. If there is an incident with the police and the citizen here, you, I can guarantee there will be a riot. And I've said this from 2014. Let me tell you, when I'm on the streets, the police get in my face. We were, we were fixing a box at McCardo's three weeks ago, me and the policeman, okay? So I can tell the tension with the police department with problem solving here, okay? So it is good that the chief of police is getting the right gear in case a riot does happen because then it can explode in any minute in Sioux Falls. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else this evening? If not, uh, next item, please. Item nine. A resolution approving the special assessment role for repair or demolition of real property in various areas in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Matt, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, Matt Tobias, I'm Neighborhood Services Manager for Planning and Development Services. Um, tonight, I just want to take some time real quick. I thought it'd be beneficial for the new councilors and for you, Mr. Mayor, um, just to go through kind of our processes uh, very quickly. So the first item for, uh, for our assessment rules is the demolition of real property. Um, when a complaint comes into our office on something when it comes to real property, um, we have a system in place. Um, it's a system that we follow and it's a system that actually works pretty well. Um, we will st we'll start our process by issuing, issuing a, hang on a second here. I have a couple of handouts here. Did not work. Oh, there we go. Perfect. We'll start out our process by issuing a letter. Um, the very first letter like this, this is just a general letter. It would be a notice of ordinance of violation, what's commonly known as an NOV. Um, NOV can be for something very minor. Um, this particular, we had a case last week where we had the siding falling off the back of a building. That can be handled with through an NOV. We'll send an NOV out with the date of our inspection, the date it needs to be corrected by, and as this body has heard me say before, we have a pretty good success rate, about a 90% success rate of these things taking care of themselves after our first letter. So there's one example of a notice, of, notice in order, no, a notice of violation. The second um, type of letter we would send out would, but would be what we refer to as a notice in order. This is a more serious violation. Um, this is something that has to be taken care of um, in a, in a quicker fashion, it's a, something that has, it's got a, it's a threat to human life or um, safety. So whether it be uh, broken windows in a house, whether it be uh, plumbing that's not working, functioning, functioning properly, we would address that through a notice and order. Um, and when we do these notice and orders, we always list exhibits uh, which indicate exactly what needs to be taken care of. Um, the crucial thing with a notice and order like that is um, it's our communication to the to our property owner. Um, we rely heavily on that. We want to. We our goal is to communicate with the property owner as best as we possibly can, so we make sure that they correct the violations that are that are being brought in front of them, brought in, brought in front of them. So, with that tonight, um, the very first building um, demolition that we have for this for this past year was a one property. It was a 1404 East Eighth Street. Um, the property owner is U.S. Bank. Sorry about that. The property owner is U.S. Bank, 
and the total, that's, um, the total work that was done by a contractor. That's what we're here for tonight. I want to make that very clear. Tonight, these assessment roles are work that was performed on site that was initiated by the city. So what we have here tonight is the, very, the, the first one here is for $178.57, and that was for our contractor going to board up a vacant home that was being squatted in at that point in time. There were squatters that were in the home. We went through, we found out it was owned by U.S. Bank, and they did not react to, the, to our notice, and so we had to take matters into our own hand and board it up. So that's the very first one. Do we want to do these all together at once, or should we separate them? Um, I think we should. East, let's go each resolution at once. So I, then think I think we you guys should. Will, mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to that specific um, item? If not, questions for Matt on that one? Mr. Mayor? Yeah. If I could, Matt, start. I just had a quick question. Is this situation with U.S. Bank resolved then, or is this still an abandoned, boarded-up building that has further action, or are there other violations on this particular This particular property, property I know it's still boarded up. It's still owned by U.S. Bank, um, and the U.S. Bank has, has, the, has the property for sale right now. Um, so it is, they're actively trying to sell the property, but I believe we've mowed it a couple times. Um, they're just choosing not to take any action at this point in time. We've mowed it or they've we've, mowed it? We've had our contractor mow it. So they'll be assessed for that next year yes. if they choose not to pay it between yep. now. So it's a continuing yep. saga? Mm -hmm. And we've spoken at length with the neighbors in the area. Um, the neighbors are concerned about this because it, it's in a nice area. The house has got a lot of potential. But I think the problem that's going on is that U.S. Bank has a price too high right now. So. I'm not willing to go there, but there's no one local that we can get a hold of from U.S. Bank to take care of this? Or we, this we definitely a... try. Um, we, do, we definitely try. <laughs> yep. Counselor Staley? Hey, Matt, you back? Uh, yep. What was that now? Okay. Yeah, Listed there that Kind of like, was it our exhibit A? No, no, you just turned it off. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, put the exhibit, yeah, put that exhibit up, please. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious as to, um, like, the kitchen sink instance, how would you even know that was going on in somebody's house? We would, we would be there to inspect it. We would, we would get, we would have access to inside to inspect that property. And, and because someone had called you to come inside. Yep. Oh, yep. so you're not just making a... No, we would not. No, Just no. go in and look at somebody's No, bathroom. this is a very general. It was just, this one has to deal with windows. It has to deal with a kitchen sink drain. It has to deal with smoke detectors. So that, the only time we would make those observations were the, if we were actually in the property and would conduct an inspection. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Councilor Neitzer. So an example like that, are you empowered to enter a property if, if the tenant makes a complaint without the property owner's permission? Yes, um, we can be invited in by a tenant. And most commonly, we are invited in by tenants. And then the, the tenant can invite us in, but if we're met at the front door by the landlord, and the landlord says, you, I do not grant you access, then we do not, we do not grant access. And then, as you all know, we'll, we would, if the situation was bad enough, we would go after, we would work with our attorney's office to get an inspection warrant. If we had to, which those are very rare. Okay. I will move approval of this item, Neitzert. Motion approved by Councillor Neitzert, seconded by Councillor Brecky. Uh, any further discussion? If not, a roll call vote on that, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Silbert? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. That is pass eight to zero. And for those at home, we have new audiovisual equipment in our council chambers. So Bruce, as Bruce pointed out, we're still figuring out the mic. So bear with us a little bit on that, if you would. Thank you. Next item, item 10. A resolution approving the special assessment role for litter removal in various areas in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Hello, Matt Tobias, uh, Neighborhood Services Manager again. Um, the second thing we have on the docket for tonight for assessment rolls has to do with litter cleanups. 
Um, our health department um, is the one department that actually works. They're the ones who send the letters out. They're the ones who deal, they, they take the complaints for the litter pickups. Um, the health department actually has three different litter pickup scenarios. And with that, there's three different letters that actually can be sent out. Um, the first one I wanna talk about tonight is what we call a, well, I'm gonna say, this is what I would call it. I call it a three-day garbage notice. When we get a complaint in the health department of actual garbage being stored outside someone's pro on someone's property, we can issue a letter saying that this garbage must be picked up within three days. Okay, when I say garbage, I'm talking household garbage, stuff that poses an immediate, immediate health risk. Okay, so those types of scenarios like that, a letter will go out. Letter will go out just like that. Dating, it'll, it'll be dated. It will specify the ordinance violation. It will specify in that letter what is actually outside. And then we'll give them a date to when we're going to be back to pick it up. And if that's not picked up within those three days, that's when we would actually have our own staff go out and actually have to pick up that, that's that litter, the garbage from the landfill staff. So that's one case scenario. The other scenario would be what I refer to as a 14-day notice letter. That would be for any other items, whether it be junk, whether it be rubbish material that was, that was reported, to our, reported to us, being the health department, and then an inspector went out and was able to verify that. Then this letter would go out, and we're giving, them, giving someone 14 days to abate the nuisance. So that's another example of, a, of another letter that would go out from the health department. The third and final letter um, that would go out from the health department would be a, an injunction. It's when we have a court order. Every once in a while, um, as I always talk about the 90% success rate, uh, the other 10%, unfortunately, we have to go to court for sometimes to get these cases solved. At that point in time, when we have a property in court, we sometimes we are granted a judgment from the courts in a stipulated agreement to let what allows the city to go in and correct any violations that are on site. So a typical letter like this could be sent out. We have, we have a half dozen or so of these stipulated agreements. And trust me, we do not, we don't, we don't enjoy these agreements. That's not, we don't like to take people's stuff. Quite frankly, we're not in that business. We don't want to be in that business. But every once in a while, we'll have to do that. So we send a letter out notifying the property owner that you're in violation of a stipulation agreement and we will be there on such and such date to pick up the remaining the items that are in violation on site. So that's something that will go out as well. So with that being said, um, for litter cleanups in Minnehaha County, um, this last that are being assessed, the total dollar amount was $17,887.12. Okay, thanks, Matt. Any, any uh, public input on this item? Okay, see none. Questions for Matt on this topic. Councilor Staley. Okay, Matt. Yes. Um, so let's go back to the first letter. Okay. You send somebody out, they've got some garbage, and you said, um, how much time are you giving them usually to take? Because I, I actually had this, my neighbors moved out, they left their garbage yes. there. And so what's the time turnaround? It's three days on okay. that garbage notice. Okay, so three days, days and mm -hmm. then if they, they don't do it, then they get the 14-day notice? If they don't do it within those three days, we will do it. We would have our landfill staff would go out and actually cor and correct that violation. And then what happens? Then it's that their their work there that did on site is then is then assessed to them. They would receive a bill for that work. Do they get a fine too? They do. Like that. They do. Yes, they do. They do get a fine as well. How much is the fine? I'll probably say it's a hundred a hundred dollars. It's a hundred dollar okay, fine. A nice yep. round number. Okay, mm -hmm. so then let's say that they have garbage the next month. Yep. Uh, then what happens? They've Depends the on the type of garbage. Out of, okay. Okay, so same it's, thing. Same the garbage thing. out on the curb. The process have... goes back again. Uh, another three-day notice. If they do not pick it up, if they don't take care of it, then we would pick it up, and then the next time it would be a $200 citation. And then I'll just... They, get, they get the three-day. Okay. Yep. Then we'll go... Let's to say the... that there's one more time yep. in the summer. Yep. Really... Same process. It is the same process. We'll give another three-day notice. If they fail to do it, we'll do the work, and then the next time it would be a $300 citation. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Other questions for Matt, counselors? If not, can I get a motion to approve this? Move to approve, Erickson. 
Second, Kylie. Motion to approve, Councilor Erickson, seconded by Councilor Kylie. Any further discussion? Uh, if not, a roll call vote, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Sailberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. That's passed 8 to 0. Uh, next item number 11. A resolution approving the special assessment rule for snow removal in various areas in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Matt Tobias, Neighbor Services Manager again. Um, the one thing I want to I want to mention right now tonight, um, I didn't. I, I apologize. I did not include this for our vegetation. Well, actually, vegetation is coming up later. Sorry about that. Um, the first thing I want to talk about with snow is we, per our ordinance, we are required to post this in the paper as a public notice. So if you look back, this public this was our ordinance was published on Friday, October 6, twenty seventeen. Friday, October 13th, 2017. So we public notice our ordinance per our ordinance. We have to do it two consecutive um, bi biweekly, twice through a year like that. So we want to make sure that everybody is aware of that. Um, we don't have to go back to this very often, but per our ordinances, we're required to do that. With snow, with sidewalk snow, it's a challenge. Um, we don't really have a letter process that we send out with sidewalk snow. Um, just the fact that our ordinance requires sidewalk snow to be removed from the sidewalk within 48 hours. We can't guarantee a letter will get to someone's property within 48 hours. So you'll see we do these um, really fancy <laughs> green, uh, bright green door hangers. Um, the reason why they're green is we want you to see them. Um, but what we'll do is when we get a complaint on a sidewalk that's not been cleaned from snow or ice, uh, my staff will go out, they'll actually verify the complaint and if the complaint's verified at that point in time, we always do, the first thing we do is try to get a hold of the person. We wanna make it, we, before we even, I'm gonna back up. Before we even go out, we're gonna call that person and know if it's a registered rental property, we're gonna be in contact with that person. We're gonna say, hey, we got a complaint on your sidewalk. Could you please take care of it? And then the next day, we'll go out and verify if it was taken care of or not. And then if it's not taken care of, we'll put a door hanger on. That door hanger says that we're gonna be back within 24 hours from that time. So really our 48 hour sidewalk snow ordinance gets drug out a little bit longer because we're trying to make sure that people take care of it before we have to. But so that's, that's kind of how we do it. Our staff, um, I apologize again, this is Dan Hine. He's one of our property maintenance inspectors. He's helping me out running the computer tonight. So on a, on a situation like this with Dan being on the west side, Dan covers everything west of Minnesota Avenue. We get a complaint. Dan would go out and put a door hanger on the property. On that door hanger, we're gonna, we're gonna fill everything out, we're gonna take date, time, let you know we're gonna be back there. So once again, we're trying our best. I feel like we're, we go out of our way to make sure we communicate with the property owners to make sure that we don't wanna issue citations if we don't have to. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, last, last year, for this assessment roll, for Minnehaha County, we had $2,867.16 were assessed. And then also in Lincoln County, uh, we had $120.12 that will be assessed. Thanks, Matt. Would any, anyone from the public wish to speak on this topic? Counselors, questions for Matt. Counselor Staley. Okay, Matt. Yes. Um, now, first of all, and we just got an email about this, but you can clarify this for the public. Mm-hmm. Um, because there, there's been a concern. I think this might have dealt with the, the vegetation thing, but I'll, I'm going to bring it up now because it could also apply to snow removal. Sure. But this person who emailed us was under the impression, in my understanding here, that, in, that as a landlord, mm -hmm. that there was something in place that if, if a tenant has a problem and he's, there's, he's registered, that you are going to be notifying the landlord as well mm -hmm. when a problem happens. Is that, is that correct? Well, let me, let, me, let me tell you this. I, had a, I spoke in length with this individual that we're talking about um, today. Um, to make it very clear, and I, at least I'll explain it to her, this person's, this person's situation is where she serves as the property owner, the landlord, and the property manager. So, so she serves all three of those capacities. So she gets one letter that goes out to her. And when we send a letter out, that just goes directly to her because she serves all that. We do not, from a property maintenance perspective, when it comes to sidewalk snow and vegetation, we do not send letters to tenants. We send letters directly to the owners. Now, her specific case was she felt that it would be beneficial for us to send a letter to the tenant as well. 
Now, our, the way we've always done things is we've always just gone after the owner. The owner's the one ultimately responsible. If we're gonna take someone to court, the owner comes to court, not the tenant. So it's the owner's responsibility to pass that on, the communication on, to the tenant. Now, I'll speak for the health department. The health department may have a similar situation where they may, a, a unique situation where they may send a letter out to a tenant. With that, it may be um, someone, if they, let's say if their car's parked on the front lawn, they can run those license plates and that will come back to that person. So they will send a letter to that person at that property. Um, there's, there's, a, there's very few cases where we'll actually send letters to tenants. But from a property maintenance perspective, everything that we do, it's all the responsibility of the owner. I explained that to her. I invited her to come in and discuss this with myself, with uh, Ryan Sage, our city attorney, and my staff. And I think what we have is a differing of opinions, but I said, let's all get together. Let's, let's talk it out. Good. Um, and let's just see if we can see if we can find some common ground. Because she seemed to have a, an idea that under Huther's administration, yes. there was a different protocol. Yeah. I yes. explained that to her and she just, and she feels that she's really advocating for the tenant. She wants us to notify the tenant mm -hmm. on those situations. And what we, the way we look at it is that if we're notifying the property owners, ultimately the, the, prop, the person responsible is the property owner. Right. So, so back to this snow removal thing. Um, so somebody, John Doe down the street, mm -hmm. so, hasn't got his sidewalk shoveled and, and he's going to get this, you're going to try to knock on his door. Mm -hmm. Then if he doesn't do that, then he's going to have, you said more than 48 hours. Yep. Really? Okay. And so then if he goes out there after 30 hours and shovels it, he's okay. Mm -hmm. You bet. He's okay. Okay, good. That happens. Let's say that happens in December. Mm -hmm. January comes. John Doe once again has not shoveled his sidewalk. Mm -hmm. What happens then? He gets a door hanger again. He gets, and how much time does he get to shovel it again? The same time. Same time, good. Okay, and then John has been very negligent, and, and let's just say we get a snowstorm in March, mm -hmm. and John has not shoveled the sidewalk. Yep. What happens? He gets a door hanger again. He gets, so he gets another mm -hmm. possibly 48 hours to do it. Yep. Before any financial fines, anything comes on him. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. As long as Mr. John Doe is taking care of his problem every time. Okay, got Within it. Within that 48 hours. Yeah, 48. Got it. Hmm. Thank you. Other questions for Matt? If not, can I look for a motion to approve this item? Motion to approve. Second. Motion approved by Councillor Brecky, seconded by Councillor Sale. Any further discussion on the council? If not, a roll call vote, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley. Yes. That is passed eight to zero. Next item number 12. A resolution approving the special assessment rule for tree trimming in various areas in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Hello, Matt Tobias again from Neighborhood Services Manager. Um, I want, I'm just going to briefly talk about these. Um, for Minnehaha County last, for this assessment rule, we had uh, $10,137.99. And for Lincoln County, we had $1,050. And parks, rep, uh, representatives from Parks and Recreation are here for any questions. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this item? Questions for Matt? Councilor Staley. And maybe Dwayne wants to address yes. this. Dwayne? Sure. Because well, he's more involved in this than you are, Matt. Right? Yes, okay. Okay, so Dwayne. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Th thank Dwayne you. Dwayne Stahl, Forestry Supervisor. $15,000, So what's that comprised of? Is that the $150 that you did to trim their trees? Those are, that represents three different programs that we uh, run. One is a uh, dead and diseased tree. Uh, each year we survey the city for dead and diseased trees on private property. We sent out a, a letter asking them to remove the tree by October 1st. If the tree isn't removed, um, we send an order to remove the tree by November 1st. Uh, if it is not removed after that date, then we send it to the attorney's office. And we may have to go to the point of getting an inspection warrant to actually go on the property and mark the tree. We then uh, package them together, put it out for uh, bids, and uh, we 
we award each tree removal, uh, each property on a uh, individual case. So we try to get the property owners the lowest bid we can with the arborists that are out there. We award it to the arborists. They remove the tree, we pay the arborist, and then we invoice the property owner for that. For that removal. Do you add another fee onto that too? There's no other fee on okay. that. Okay, no. and how many of those situations did you have this year? I believe there were four. I'm not quite four? sure. I think there were four. Four. Yes. And were any of these people in what we would call disabled, elderly, maybe lacking Not that I'm means? aware of. Huh? Not that I'm aware of. We've tried to reach out to them. Not that I'm aware of. And so they, throughout this whole process that you, you made several attempts to talk with them? And, yes. I mean, before you take bids to remove a tree yes. off of their own property? Yes, two letters and then an inspection warrant, which we would post. If we don't get any... Uh, contact, then we'd put a posting on the door that we're going to come the next day and mark this tree. They can be there if they would like to. We tell them what, what time we'll be there. And if uh, nobody showed up on those. Is there any kind of a registered letter that goes out? No. Certified. So you have no way of really knowing that these people got the notice other than you put it. Did you emailed it to them too? Just through snail mail, yes. Okay. And then uh, the other thing with this, the other, how much of the, the, that assessment came from that money? The 15500 If you look at the items in there, the ones that were over the 150 would be the, the dead tree and um, removals that we did. The 100, over 150. The 150, then that is, those are those people who, they got the letter, they either didn't do it to your specifications or didn't do it at all, and then you hired someone else to come and do it? For the dead and diseased trees. Right, for, for the boulevard situation. No, the boulevard. No, I'm, I'm, I'm moving on now to boulevard. Okay, so yeah. then there's two other uh, programs that we operate. One is a tree complaint. Uh, somebody can call in and, and uh, report a low-hanging branch over a street or sidewalk. We would uh, follow up a verification of that We'd send out a letter asking for the trees to be trimmed. We uh, give approximately three weeks to have that done. We'll go back if the... Uh, Hold, do you identify which tree it is, Dwayne, at that time? No. Okay. It's the whole property has to be into compliance. But I mean, if there's a complaint over the sidewalk or something, we they just get a note that... Yeah, we bring the whole property into compliance is what we do at that time. So after three weeks, we'll go back and do a reinspection. If the property is still not trimmed up to code, we'll leave a door, door hanger asking for additional trimming. At that point, we're a little more specific. If there's just one tree, we'll say the tree by the mailbox. And uh, we'll give them a, an extra week. We'll come back if, the, if it uh, is still not trimmed. Then we'll take a picture of it before we trim it. Then we'll take a picture of it after we trim it for our documentation to show the need, and then we invoice them for that service. At a mem minimum of 150. Yes, it's, uh, the letter states it's $150 an hour, minimum one hour, correct. Okay, so that's, and then what, the third thing is? Project trim. So in this case, we have the, um, for our new council members and mayor, the city's divided up into five, <clears throat> five uh, areas. We do one area a year, so we get through the city every five years. We're on our third cycle now. So this area that we go into in a year, we divide it up into three areas. Generally, this year we had to uh, divert from that process, but we'll inspect uh, an area in, the, in uh, February, an area in June, and an area in September. Uh, we do a uh, windshield survey. We uh, note which properties uh, need, need trimming. We've uh, improved our process by using iPads, and it has uh, improved our efficiency because before we just did it on a paper, and then we had to transfer it into a form or database to, to manage all the, the properties. We take that uh, survey, and we, we send out a letter to those property owners that need to, to have their properties trimmed. We give them a due date. At that due date, we come back. If the property's trimmed, the process stops. If there's additional trimming needed, we'll leave a door hanger. 
give an additional time. We come back after that time. If it's still in need of trimming, then we'll do the, the we'll, same process. We'll take a, a picture before we trim it, and then we'll take a picture after, and then we bill them for that service. At the 150 minimum? Correct. Thank you. And so uh, just a comment, um, Duane, and you, we've talked about this through the years. I, I don't like this program. I think we can do better. Other communities in South Dakota, which we like to compare water rate usage costs, we're always comparing with other cities. And we could compare with other cities um, that they provide this for their citizens. And I know that costs extra money. That's why I wanted to have a meeting with the mayor and the warden to talk about bringing inmate help in so that they could help you trim the trees. So we don't have to go through all of this marking and calling and, and uh, well, you're not calling, you're just coming back and coming back and coming back and then cutting. So if we could do this for our citizens, I just think it would be such a great thing of goodwill and such a great service. So I'm hoping we're going to be able to supplement what you're doing moving forward. Plus, we, we've given you extra money for a budget. I know Emerald Ash Borer. And, and of course, we've also, I'm wondering if since we, we, we halted the project trim, did these fines come before that happened? Or how, how did that come about? Yes, this, uh, this assessment runs from July to July, basically. So it was after, it would have been the fall trimming that we did last year in 17 and the spring trimming we did this year in 18. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's problematic on this for me is that we, and I've asked, I've been asked by citizens about if, if we have any kind of low income assistance or, you know, for elderly people, people on fixed budgets. And, and there's nothing. Our city does nothing to help people out. Even like the snow removal, we used to have the Scoop It program, which led me to meet with the warden last year because they provided that for our citizens, and then they, they stopped it. So again, caring for our people and saying, you know, government is here to help. It's not here to hurt. And to me, Project Trim hurts. And so I think we can do better. I'm hoping that as we move forward, we're going to, I'm going to vote no on, the, on these assessments today because I, I think, well, first of all, a lot of people in our city haven't even had to deal with it this summer. So it's, uh, I'm just hoping we're going to get something better, Duane, okay? Nothing against you, but I just think we can do better. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Neitzer. Yeah, I, I did a uh, project trim ride along where I spent half a day, maybe a year ago, and I'm very happy to hear that you did the paper to the iPad Working very well. I'll maybe take a little credit for that because I, I remember mentioning it to the driver because I had a, a notepad and I was actually writing down the addresses for that half day as he was doing the measurements. So I was in on it, I guess. But um, so that's great. So I'm hoping you can just kind of tap an address and, and yep. be a lot more efficient. So that's great. Um, one, one thing that's worth clarifying is when you're putting these notices out, would it be fair to say that there's a phone number on there so at any particular point throughout getting these notices somebody could certainly call your office and ask for clarification or yes both the letter and the uh, door hanger has uh, a number on it that would get to me uh, we uh, we approve any extensions people call in need extra time we're always accommodating as much as we can be yeah i i, I just wanted to i, I certainly understand um, the sensitivity and concern but there are things that I think are fair to say that have been done kind of in to make the process a little bit better and give citizens more opportunities to comply. And there are quite a few steps and chances of which to engage you and say, what tree are we talking about? Could you help me out a little bit? Does this look right? And so a, a, a lot of that's there. So I, I do appreciate that. I, I'm definitely open to, because tree trimming is expensive. I mean, I, I hire a tree trimmer and I can't get them to come out to trim my tree for less than 200 bucks just to show up. And that is expensive. So um, I'm willing to look at other options. My only one thing, hesitation that I think we have to look at is I, I wouldn't want to oversimplify it. You certainly can damage and butcher a tree if you don't know what you're doing. So I don't, you know, if you're just, someone with no training just hacking at the tree or whatever. You know, I, I, I could see property owners being rather upset if their tree gets butchered by somebody that doesn't know what they're... So I think there would have to be some sort of training. I don't know if they have a full arborist license to trim a tree, but that would be something I think we'd have to consider versus anybody probably can shovel. So just throwing that out there. Thanks, Thanks. Councillor Neitzer. Councillor Erickson. 
Thank you. Um, I just want to share, uh, unfortunately, I was a recipient of one of these letters at one of my rental properties. And um, we were heading out of town, and this was several years ago, but I want to share it again because the level of compassion that was from your department to give me some extra time and to make sure I knew which tree it was. It was on a very busy street, and so the height is higher than just a traditional regular street or the sidewalk. Um, and so I was a little confused with that. And so the time was given in the letter I received. There was a phone number. I was able to ask questions. What does it need to do? Because I didn't know. I'm not a tree trimmer. And so I wanted to make sure I knew exactly what I did, needed to have done through this process to avoid having an assessment or a fine or any of that. And so um, the process, it, it works. It's my responsibility to trim it up. And it was a danger. It was hanging right over 26th Street. And so when cars or delivery trucks or ambulances, it's a very busy street near the hospitals, go by, that's my responsibility to make sure that those cars and those people are safe and doesn't whack off into the middle of the, the road there um, and, and hurt somebody else. And so it's important for us to, to be responsible with that. And so I thank you for the opportunity. I learned a lot, and you were very easy to work with. And so um, I will make a motion to, to uh, approve this. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Second, Neitzert. Motion by Councillor Erickson, seconded by Councillor Neitzert. Councillor Staley. Well, in, um, in response to what Councillor Erickson said, when I got project trim, I called to say, could you tell me which tree it is? And I was told, no. And I was told, and I wasn't a council member at the time. Councilor Erickson is a council member. I was just a, a citizen. And I was told, be careful when you go out in the street with the ruler that you don't get hit by a car. And again, I, I don't think I, those trees belong to the city. I think the city needs to step up and take ownership of their own trees. We can do that for our citizens. Aberdeen does it. John Ball's community of Brookings does it. He's our expert we brought in. Fargo does it. Uh, Kansas City does it. A lot of communities take care of their own trees. I know it costs more, and I'm not advocating that we just take inmates and just set them loose with a chainsaw. But there are a lot of property owners who might not know how to trim their own trees either. So we're, yeah, we could do some training on this, but again, I think we can do better. I, we're a progressive, vibrant community. This is something that I've had concerns with for a long time. You've been through my neighborhood, I think, three times now. And I, I've seen it hit the elderly and people on fixed incomes very hard. Because you may be compassionate, but at the end of the day, they have to cough up that $150. If you can't get out and do it yourself, you're going to be assessed, as Councilor Neitzer said, He's got a minimum of $200 coming out. So it's a hardship for a lot of people. I think we can do better. Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Councillor Nicer, while he was speaking, I think he mentioned some key words. Uh, one was a property owner could be upset if their tree is butchered. And I think the key word was their tree. Um, when I moved into my home, there wasn't a tree in the right of way. I planted the tree in the right-of-way. The city didn't come along and plant trees in the right-of-way. It's not the city's practice to do that in front of private residences. Uh, maybe along the parks, that's a different story, but people are not assessed for trimming the trees in the right-of-way along a park. So I knowingly put the tree there. Uh, I, I knew that I was responsible for that tree. Quite frankly, I would prefer to be responsible for that, for the trimming, to make sure it's done correctly. Uh, I too have had a tree that was tagged in the past and the individuals that I contacted were very good about helping me identify, well, there's only one tree there at the time, but specifically which branches needed, needed to be done or needed to be uh, removed. So, uh, but the key thing was it was my tree, I put it there. I should be responsible for it. Um, Having said that, if there are possibilities to put programs in place for individuals that have hardships, I'm all in favor of investigating that as well, too. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your service. Thank you. Councilor Staley. One more question. Duane, are you telling people which tree needs to be trimmed? In the letter, no. We are, but are you saying now that if a person gets a letter and they call you and they say, can you tell us which branch it is? You're going to do that for our people? Well, generally, when 
when we send out these notices, we're sending out a thousand letters at a time. And sure, everybody liked to have us come out and show which branch. So originally, no, we we liked them to uh, to uh, try it themselves, look at the diagrams that we put together, watch the video that I put together for them, and then when we come back out, where's the video? It's on our website. It's on. But our, I'm telling an elderly per. I know a lot of people in our community that aren't really too into the technology. It's thing. also in the library. Okay. So, but at the end of the day, are you going to tell everybody who calls? Are you going to come out and tell them which branch? Generally, if we have, if we need to do that, we would do that. Yes. You're, okay, that's that's a new, that's a new thing. I've, okay, well, good. I'm glad you're committing to that. It's it's not new. Okay. Councilor Sale, I just want to say, <clears throat> as a as a former fireman that got whacked by these branches as we drove by, I'm hoping you become very aggressive in Project Trim. Our snow plows are getting damaged, our fire trucks are getting damaged, a lot more than the $15,000 that we're gonna assess the public. So I hope you get very aggressive and clean up those branches. And I appreciate the work you do. I'm gonna to vote to support this. We have a motion and a second on the floor. Any further discussion? Dwayne, thank you. If not, I'd ask for a roll call vote, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Delbert? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? No. That passes 7 to 1. Next item number 13, please. A resolution approving the special assessment role for the mowing of weeds and grasses in various areas in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Matt, welcome back. Yep, Matt Tobias, Neighborhood Service Manager, back at it again. So um, this one we're talking about here is with our nuisance vegetation. And I'll start off by showing you an example of a, the publication in the Argus Leader. <coughs> Same thing, uh, we post, uh, per our ordinance, we post that once a year. Um, also, this is another copy of an example of a vegetation letter that gets sent out. Um, once we identify a property that's in violation, we get a complaint, Dan would get a complaint on a property on the west side of Sioux Falls. Um, he would go out and identify that it's in violation of our vegetation ordinance, whether it be noxious weeds or vegetation that is eight inches or higher. Um, the very first time we identify that property um, in a growing season, um, we send a letter out. And in this letter, it gives you seven days to correct the violation. If after the seven days, if my inspectors go back out and the violation is corrected, all is well. But if the violation is not corrected in that seven days, then we have to hire a contractor to go out and take care of the violation. At that point in time, there will also be a $100 citation for the first violation. The letter that we send out is a courtesy letter. Um, it's not something that our ordinance says that we have to do. We developed it and we, de we developed it uh, for that reason. We wanted to make sure we gave everybody a notification of it, but it is on the only letter they will receive throughout the calendar year. No, throughout, I'm going to say that again, throughout the growing season, we're very specific on that. So if someone gets a letter, they're in violation, we get called back out again, we do not have to send another letter out. We automatically just send it to our contractor to, to uh, we dispatch our contractor to take care of the problem, uh, mitigate the violation, and then we also is, issue a citation with that. So that's how our vegetation ordinance um, works. And with that being said, um, this past year, um, this past assessment, I keep saying here, but this past assessment season, um, in Minnehaha County, our total vegetation assessments was $13,522. And in Lincoln County, it was $1,833. Thanks, Matt. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this topic? Uh, questions for Matt on this topic, counselors? Councilor Staley. Matt. Yes. So, John Doe. And of course, this is this is the same thing as snow. I mean, it's just a summer thing. Snow is the winter mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So John Doe, just to clarify, John Doe doesn't. His grass is nine inches tall. Okay. He's got Mildred next door who doesn't like his grass, so she turns him in nine mm -hmm. inches. So he he gets he gets the the letter. Yep. He gets the seven days, and then he gets he gets he, he mows his lawn, right? So mm -hmm. he's okay. So then, that was, that was happening in May, a very rainy month. So then um, June comes along, Mildred's out there with the, the ruler and sees, oh, 
Uh, John Doe's got his grass is nine inches long again. She calls it in. You immediately give him a hundred dollar fine. Yes. And then April or uh, excuse me, August comes along, another rainy month, and and nine inches, and Mildred calls again, and a hundred dollar fine. Yes. So, it's, to me, we've got a discrepancy here with our with our policies because which is more dangerous, nine inches of grass or a slippery sidewalk? We're giving that property owner who has the sidewalk problem multiple chances. We're giving him 48 hours to fix it. Hmm. I, I, to me, it would make sense to put that same standard in for grass. And I mean, I, I don't know, do we want to change it at some point to say, you know, the guy with the ice on the sidewalk, you get one chance and after that you get the $100? I will be much more lenient to people with ice. Mm, and, and that's actually a much more dangerous situation than nine inches of grass. I totally understand where you're coming from. Um, the previous department that actually had this vegetation prior to us, they, they tried that. And it's not something we developed on our own. They tried where they were issuing letters every time. And what happened was you can go through an entire summer with just getting letters like that. Well, or door hangers. I mean, you could use the same thing you're doing for the snow. You're putting a door hanger on but there. I'm, but what I'm saying is that when, you give, when you're giving someone so much time in a situation like we're in now, we've had the wettest summer mm -hmm. for a long time, and they're not taking care of that grass, and that grass gets taller and taller. So we go by and we go, another seven days, another seven days. And I'll, I'll just say this. This is not a huge problem. It's not. We, we have a lot of voluntary compliance with our vegetation ordinance. Now, are there, are there properties on that list that did not pay their tickets? There, yes, there are. Well, you got $200,000 worth. But it's, it's I, honestly, I, counselor, well, somebody, it's, somebody didn't comply. Of all, the, of all the properties we have in our city, um, it's just we're not just, we're, it's, is it a problem? Yes, but we're not seeing the numbers that we should for a city of our size. I'll just, I'll be really upfront and say that. But, but I just think, I think either we, we need to, Tighten up on what we do for snow, the snow. Mm -hmm. why, aren't, why aren't you looking at giving those people with the snow violations the $100? Why do they keep getting a repeated warnings at each month or each? Why is that? They, with, their, with our snow like that, we do a door hanger, and we cannot send a letter like that, and we just we go out. But why wouldn't they? I mean, they again, you get one time, and mm -hmm. then you know, hey, this is what the city wants, and mm -hmm. then, oh, but, well, next time. I mean, so they just kind of keep doing and it. I'll, and I'll speak, for, I'll speak for my staff. You have 48 hours to, you know. Mm -hmm. not, not that I'm trying to make it harder on anybody, mm -hmm. but I just think that... The, Again, I think they're, you're being much harder on the, the people with the grass problem. And, and I can see, you know, there are people who have, you see where there's mm -hmm. great problems. But if you talk about, you know, 10 inches, and, and I had it happen to me. My grass was like 10 inches long and someone turned me yeah. in. But so, I, just, I mean, I can, I can speak from experience mm -hmm. on that. I want to I emphasize that uh, the, it's a courtesy letter that we send out. That's something that we're doing. We're doing that by courtesy. And I'm saying maybe a door hanger could be just as yep. effective. I mean, if the snow thing works, a door hanger, why not grass with a door hanger, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Okay. Councilor Erickson. Just a point of clarification, yes. Matt. Um, it's not $200,000, right? It's... 20000 excuse yeah. me. 20000 okay. I just I just want to make sure we didn't think yeah, it was $200,000 in assessments because I show it's $15,355 mm -hmm. it's, And it's like I said, it's, we, we don't... We don't, and we're, and, and I'll, I'll speak for my staff. Uh, we go out of our way. We go out of our way to make those phone calls. We're not hanging paper to hang paper. That's not our intention at all. Um, these guys, I listen to these guys on the phone. I mean, they're contacting people, giving people breaks, saying, oh, we're in, you know, if you call us, if you communicate with us, we're going to work with you. That's what we're going to do. But unfortunately, part of our job that we have to do is the unfortunate part is the citation part. That's not fun for anybody involved, and that's not our main intention. So I want to over, I'm going to emphasize again that that $20,000 for a city of our size, 157,000 people and the amount of properties in our city, it's, we're, we're getting a lot of voluntary compliance. I'll say that. Councilor Neitzer. It's a valid discussion about the consistency, but mm -hmm. I do want to speak for the other side of this, which is I have four or five neighbors in the northwest part of town that are, frankly, fed up and irate over, and it's not directed at you, mm -hmm. but, you know, property owner's no longer there, house has a sticker mm -hmm. on it, it's full of feces, and the lawn's not getting mowed, there's mm -hmm. weeds everywhere, and what they're saying is, what's taking so long, you know, so 
Um, if, if I was to tell them that every time the, the lawn got long that it was going to take, that you were going to have to do a letter and wait, yeah. you know, whatever, I mean, they're, they're already fed up because they've got, because of all of this, uh, due process is important, but because of all of that, you also have the neighbors on the other side who are just frankly putting up with some of this mm -hmm. with those very small group of owners yep. who are not absent or just are not taking care of business mm -hmm. that frankly have to put up with it. And, and so those are the calls we get. Those are, those are the calls we get to the irate neighbors next door. And especially in that situation like that. And it's not something that when we get one call, it's not like it's not on our radar. You know, we don't drive by it. It doesn't, nothing, nothing pings in our system to say, check this one out, check this one out. It's all on complaint basis, you know? And so, especially with that one, we weren't getting a lot of complaints on it. And that particular neighbor next door was really completely fed up with it. And she's like, why are you guys not doing anything with this? Well, we don't, we don't react until we get a complaint. Hmm. So, we'll leave it at that. Thanks, Matt. Councilor Starr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Matt, one of the things that I, I guess we should point out too, is the people on this list that we're placing assessments on their property, these aren't all the people who got fined over the course no. of the year. These are the people or individuals or organizations that chose not to pay. Yep. We gave them till five o'clock today, probably mm -hmm. they could have brought a mm -hmm. check in yep. and, and yep. paid these. So we've got to go an extra step. Mm -hmm. So saying that, I look at items in the page on it's item 29 and 31 yep seems to be the the same local bank that chooses not to pay the fine mm -hmm. or the assessment all right yep. let me back up i'll use the word invoice they've chosen not to so while we've been sitting here i looked up us bank on the chamber's website mm -hmm. and mr carl winia is the local contact yep he should step up and take care of this mm -hmm. or at least pay the fines by the time they're done. Yeah. I'll point out the other people on the list. It's public uh, record of who they are. Mm -hmm. They're just choosing, one, to not take care of their property because when I look at a lot of these lists, they're in my district. I've talked to people that are neighbors that have had to put up with um, these type of situations in their neighborhood, and they're similar to what Councillor Knights are saying. Mm -hmm. It's not one complaint that the city receives. The neighborhood is complaining, and yeah. they're, they're there, and we expect not only our individuals in our city, but our corporate citizens to step up and do the right thing. So Agreed. I'm going to easily uh, vote to, to mm -hmm. not have any doubt, and at some point we may need to look at the ones that are outside of that 90% that do voluntary mm -hmm. compliance to add more teeth to our ordinances. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Kiley. Man, I would just like to say thank you for a difficult job that you and your staff perform. Uh, it, is, it is difficult because uh, nobody wants to be dealing with code violations and potential fines. You do it in a very kind fashion thank as you. well. Appreciate that. Um, being a homeowner comes with responsibilities. I mean, you, you have to maintain your home. you got to keep the environment around your home safe. Uh, and in this case, compliant with city codes. Uh, and it's whether it's snow removal or grass if if it deteriorates and if it's neglected not only does it impact to your property but it impacts the properties mm -hmm. around you so thank you for your efforts thank you thank you counselor can I have a motion Move to, to approve, approve Erickson <clears throat> second Selberg Motion to approve, Councilor Erickson, seconded by Councilor Selberg. Any further discussion on this item? Councilor Sale. Yes, I'd just like to uh, thank you for the presentation on code enforcement. It's very informative thank you. to a new city council member like me. And I would just like to uh, ask Teresa Staley, Council Member Staley, uh, don't let Joe move in by me because he never mows his lawn and <laughs> never scoops his driveway. <laughs> we have it on the record. Thank you. Joe is having to work extra jobs because yeah. he's been assessed so darn much money by the city that he's trying right. to stay out of jail. We have a, <clears throat> a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Matt, thank you. Thank you. Can I get a roll call vote on this item, please? Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? No. That item passes seven to one. Next item, item 14. A resolution advising and giving consent to the appointment of members to certain citizen boards. Melanie Carpenter, Civil Service Board. Bernie Schmidt, Falls Community Health Center Governing Board. 
Is there anyone from the public who'd wish to speak to this item? If not, um, I'd ask for a motion to approve item 14. Move to approve. Second, Erickson. Move to approve by Councillor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Erickson. Any discussion amongst the councillors? Yes, Councillor Staley. Well, I, it's kind of nice. I don't know if this is done on purpose, but it's nice to have these things happening in the middle of the meeting versus at the end. And I know Councillor Erickson always asks if the people are here, and that, that way they don't have to wait for the whole till the end of the meeting, because that speaking at the end, you know, can sometimes be kind of a hardship for people sure. for input and things. So. Thank you for doing that, whoever did it. Yeah. Any other discussion on this? I, w I would ask, is Melanie and or Bernie here this evening? Okay. Uh, well, if not, um, hearing no further discussion, I'd like a roll call vote on this item, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. That passes eight to zero, item number 15. A resolution establishing the City of Sioux Falls provisional legislative priorities for the 2019 state legislative, legislative session. Hey, Jim. Good evening, Jim David, operations manager for the City Council. Each year, the City Council identifies its provisional legislative priorities for the Municipal League's policy committee meetings. What makes this last couple years unique is that this effort was joined by Minnehaha County, the cities of Brandon, Crooks, Del Rapids, and Harrisburg, and representing the city of Sioux Falls are the Sioux Falls City Councilors, uh, Councilors Erickson and Kiley. The first priority that you have in front of you and that is on the screen supports state funding for emergency radio upgrades to the national standard known as P25. The existing radios are expected to become obsolete within the next few years. Item number two supports flexibility when it comes to posting legal notices by allowing local governments the option to post on the internet or free publications such as classified newspapers. Number three is new and seeks an amendment to the existing statute, reducing the number of official newspapers for counties from two to one. This would mirror what is already in place for municipalities and school districts. Items four supports legislative efforts to improve the inventory of affordable housing in South Dakota. And item five supports a gross receipts tax on alcohol for county government. Number six, or item six, is a general statement of support for tax increment financing. Number seven is a general statement of support for additional state funding for drug and alcohol prevention. Item eight, supports a co or item eight supports cooperative activities between municipalities and counties. We have several local examples of this collaboration. It includes the law enforcement center, museums, metro communications, libraries, joint jurisdiction, and many others. Item nine was brought forward by Minnehaha County in response to the almost $1 million in sales tax that they are going to pay indirectly on the jail expansion project. As you are aware, local governments are exempt from state taxes, but private contractors who construct public projects must pay the sales tax and the contractor's excise tax, which is then passed along to the public entity. This item supports legislation that would exempt public projects from both sales tax and contractor's excise tax. Number 10 was brought forward by city planning in response to the significant cost of agency trips on paratransit, Currently, public transit providers bear the most of the costs associated with these trips. And finally, number 11 was brought forward by the city of Del Rapids and requests state funds to offset the public costs associated with the Emerald Ash Borer infestation. In the past, the state has provided more than $3 million to mitigate the mountain, excuse me, the mountain pine beetle in the Black Hills. This item hopes for, or this item hopes for a similar response when it comes to EAB. In closing, this is a provisional resolution, a final resolution be brought forward uh, later in the year once the Municipal League approves their final policy statements. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks, Jim. Uh, before we do that, is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this item? Please come forward. Bruce Danielson. I had a 
I've been kind of curious. We normally have had a working session or an informational about this process, so we at least understood what was going to happen with these these resolutions. Uh, I have a real problem based on the last eight years of a, of a certain administration that we're no longer having to deal with directly the uh, about allowing alternative publication op options for local government. Uh, one of the reasons why I have over 3,700 videos up online that I've saved is because we had an administration that uh, decided that anything that they didn't like, they got rid of. Any public record they didn't want the public to have anything to do with, they got rid of. The only thing that we have in Sioux Falls is an Argus leader that is saved at the library, and, it's, and we can go back to the 1860s or 70s and actually get official publications and what happened. We don't need to lose any more of our history, and I see a real problem with a lot of these things that were being discussed in here, and I'd sure like to uh, have a session where you guys could actually talk about it and we could be involved in it, because it's our government, too. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, counselors, questions for Jim on this. Counselor Staley. Is there, is there going to be any opportunity where we discuss this as a group, Jim? Does this come to yeah, information? Well, this, we would have, uh, but budget hearings and the time of these meetings with the other units of local government made it impossible to schedule these uh, during August. But I want to point out another fact. This is, um, this is a provisional resolution. It's not the final resolution. Uh, this is something that is uh, used for the Municipal League's policy committee meetings. It is not sent to the legislators. That happens later on in the year, and we will do an informational uh, with that, along with visiting with legislators uh, on the final policy statements. So, I mean, I, I like, well, I, I also don't want to be losing documentation of, of our, our meeting. And I, I'm also, I'm not a big, I'm not a big supporter of TIFFs. Yeah. So if I, for me to vote on this package deal, it's like, so, I mean, is this appropriate where you can make an motion to amend it yes. now? You, yes. you, or is this? No, you, could, you have the opportunity to amend uh, this resolution uh, to try to strike one of them. I will point out, though, that the alternative publication statement does say internet, but it also says uh, free publications. For example, the Shoppers News in Sioux Falls does not qualify to house the uh, legal publications. Well, so I'm going to make an I'm going to make a motion um, to to withdraw number six concerning TIFFs. Just strike it. Yeah, there's a motion on the floor by Councilor Steely to strike number six from this. Do we have a main motion? No, we don't. Oh, then I move to approve. Second, Kylie. Main motion to approve by Councilor Erickson, seconded by Councilor uh, Councilor Kylie. Now we can entertain no. okay, that motion. Okay, so I would make a, a motion to strike number six concerning TIFFs. And thank you, Councillor Starr. Mo a motion by Councillor Staley to strike item number six. Uh, do we have a second of support for that? Second. Seconded by Councillor Starr. Discussion amongst the council on that? Well, since I made the, the, the motion, um, the only thing I've had, the only thing we've dealt with on TIFFs was the Lloyd property on North Phillips Avenue. And I and our own Erica Beck was involved with that. Nothing against Craig Lloyd. I think that was wonderful that he wants to do this. But I think, to me, a TIFF, if we're using it to help a blighted area, I go for that. But I think we've, we've seen this thing used as a tool to in, promote, inject, energized development, and I just think we have to be very careful with that. So just to give it a big embrace with this thing, it just doesn't go for me. Councilor Kiley. I would just like to say that in our discussion with the other municipalities and the individuals represented, uh, everybody was in support. Now I do realize that we are voting on Sioux Falls provisional legislative priorities. These are ours, but uh, TIFFs, generally receive widespread uh, support. Uh, it's, a, it's a tool in our toolbox. It drives economic development in areas where it's often likely 
not going to take place. So I think it's, uh, again, it's a very useful tool. And I would uh, not, I will not be voting for the amendment. Councilor Erickson. I would echo a lot of the same things and um, also share that um, one of the, the, the conversations around this was upholding the integrity of the process as well, making sure that uh, we're meeting the requirements through state law that the but for is taken into account. Um, you know, TIF can't just be done just because I want to. There's a very strong process that you have to dot your I's and cross your T's. Um, specifically in the, the project that was referenced earlier, uh, you know, that project wouldn't have taken place without this TIF because of how blighted uh, and how awful the land was. And so um, every opportunity that a TIF comes forward in every single community, those elected bodies do have the chance to say no. Uh, everybody's, uh, each municipality's standard is a little bit different and really some may chuckle at this, but we're pretty conservative with TIF in Sioux Falls. When you start looking at uh, other municipalities that, that do them, sometimes ours are a little bit larger, but so is the project. It's a huge project. And so um, I will be um, supporting the resolution as is. Um, we'll have more conversations through the Municipal League um, and through our conference coming up in October, as well as, again, with the legislature um, through any of these items that are important. What I do want to, well, I'll wait till that's done and since it's only on that motion, sorry. Councillor Staley. Well, in response to Councillor Erickson, uh, saying that that project wouldn't have happened without a TIF is, we don't know that because that whole thing was shrouded in secrecy and it was the first uh, issue we had last year where we wanted to see the other proposals, whether it be in, in executive session, redact the names, whatever. We were not allowed to see what else was on the table. And I was told by someone within the Economic Development Office that there were off offers that didn't have the TIF attached. And I'm going to so, say, let's not go back into well, the except she went. TIF. Well, I understand, but she referenced that. So I, I'm just saying, I think we have every right to talk about how we've handled TIFs in our community. We do. And, and yes, and so when we're giving those things out and we don't know what other possibilities there are, I think that's a whole thing that needs to be addressed, is what are we told? And that hasn't been happening. So when you have a TIF and, and we say apples to apples, we get to see that's a different story. But I'm also going to, we're talking about TIFs here. We brought in someone from the state last year to talk to us uh, about what, what TIFs are, to give us the Fundamentals 101 on it. And we find out that, I mean, I called some superintendents after the fact, and school districts and counties aren't that hepped on, on it either because they're losing the property tax revenue as well. The city council makes the decision, but the school districts are left out of it. So it's, it's not necessarily embraced by everyone, all governmental entities in our community. And I talked with the superintendent of Harrisburg last year, and he told me I could reference this, but he is not a real big fan of TIFs because they're, they're losing that accessibility to the funds, the property taxes right away. So I understand, I, I'm probably in the minority here, but this is nothing new. I, I, I'm not a big fan of this uh, project. This Councilor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, to just to echo what Councilor Erickson had stated, uh, the city of Sioux Falls has been very careful about the TIFs, when and where they issue TIFs. I think we've issued 20 to date. One of them has not been enacted or acted upon to date. We have other municipalities around that have five times that number since this became available to, to cities around the state. So I think we have been very responsible. And I guess if I were a school district that, you know, if the TIF was just uh, offered where it wasn't necessary, I'd be upset. But that's not happening here in the city of Sioux Falls. The fact remains that if it's not developed, it's collecting zero dollars or very few dollars now undeveloped. Uh, once it is developed and it goes on the full tax rolls, then they're collecting quite a bit of money where otherwise they would not have collected anything or very little, just on the value of the property. So I think, again, it, as I stated before, it's a very useful tool uh, to maintain in our toolbox. Councilor Sale. 
Uh, I'm going to speak in opposition to the amendment, and for the reasons that you stated, Councillor Staley, it can be used for a tool to help blighted areas of town. If we do not have that tool going forward, we hamstring ourselves to maybe do a development in that area. I think that every individual TIF that comes before us has to stand on their own merits. But I'm unwilling to take one of those tools out of our toolbox for development of blighted communities, which I think you would support a TIF for a blighted community. So I will speak opposed to the amended motion and in favor of the main motion. And if I may respond, I'm, I don't think this this is even, if this wasn't in here, it doesn't mean we're never going to give a TIF again. This is just giving an, uh, just a pat on the back of this is a, a great thing. So. Any further discussion on this? If, if, if not, I need a motion, or excuse me, I need a vote on the uh, amendment to strike item six. Council members Brecky? No. Erickson? No. Kylie? No. Neitzert? No. Selberg? No. Sale? No. Starr? No. Staley? Yes. That fails seven to one. And now we will uh, look for a discussion on the main motion. Thank you, Councilor Mr. Mayor, if I can. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about this process that it's kind of changed over the years. Um, from when um, I first came on the council, um, we didn't do uh, a whole lot of collaborating with the legislature. And so that was a passion of mine. I thought, I thought Jim was our lobbyist. <laughs> and so I remember going, gosh, why don't we see him at Pier ever? And I'll tell you, that's what a lot of the, leg the legislators had thought because they didn't realize kind of the dynamics of, of a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, so I'll tell you, with, with that, my passion when I started four years ago was to bring those legislators together with us as counselors. And we've done a really good job of that, all of us have, of reaching out with um, legislators to, to building those relationships when they don't like a particular blinking light somewhere. I know that sounds silly, but that was uh, something that a legislator brought towards uh, to me um, the, a while ago. Or if we have an issue with something, we have that direct connection. And so we've got to be working together for those um, legislators that serve Sioux Falls as well as us serving those legislators. And so it's been a fun process kind of trying to shape this and um, this actually was not with the legislators, but we'll talk with them eventually um, through the process. But this was in collaboration with Lincoln County, Minnehaha County, and then we started reaching out to the regions because what's good for the region is also good for Sioux Falls. It's not just about Sioux Falls. It's about Hartford. It's about Harrisburg. It's about Humboldt. It's about, I mean, all these other municipalities. And it's been so fun getting to know some of the other mayors as well as um, city council members um, and learning the challenges that they have um, in their municipalities. Oftentimes it's just a couple extra zeros on the end of, of our problems that they have in their community. Um, you know, on a much bigger scale. And so some of these um, did come directly from, from other cities. Um, some of them are directly from the counties. And so we want to come forward with some sort of a package that we can unite around and kind of impact change. And we've seen great success um, over the last couple of years. Um, last year kind of was the year of the county where we really supported a lot of efforts for the county and tried to um, kind of rally around them and help them um, get through a, a couple of, of minor changes that did help us as well. And so I would ask for your support on this. Um, there'll be lots of opportunities for us to continue to get together with legislators um, and kind of continue those conversations as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Mayor. Councillor Starr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, item number seven, I would move to amend by adding the words after provides funding for adding tobacco slash tobacco, tobacco type products, comma. A motion by Councilor Starr to add those words. Do we have those in the minutes? <laughs> I gave her a copy. The All clerk right. has a copy. All right, great. Uh, a motion by Councilor Starr to amend that. Second. Seconded Staley. by Councilor Staley. Discussion on that. Right. I think one of the things that, uh, that the state does do is provide, uh, uh, collects a tobacco tax to promote cessation and uh, tobacco awareness and to continue to fund those projects. Uh, currently, the, the state has taken some of those dollars that were originally uh, earmarked for tobacco uh, 
uh, awareness and uh, has moved them to other general fund items and to encourage them to use those dollars towards uh, tobacco education like they were originally intended. Thank you, Councilor Starr. Other discussion on that? If not, I'd ask for a roll call vote on that amendment, please. Council Members Brecky. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Kiley. Yes. Neitzert. Yes. Selberg. Yes. Sale. Yes. Starr. Yes. Staley. Yes. That amendment passes 8 to 0. And so now um, I am looking for discussion on the amended main motion, if there's any further discussion on that. Councillor Kiley. I would just like to talk a little further about the um, supporting legislation allowing alternative public uh, publication options for local governments. Um, currently, that's generally our, our public notices uh, are going out in newspapers. While the city of Sioux Falls population has increased, the um, number of individuals actually subscribing to the local newspaper has decreased or is at least not keeping pace with population. So there seems to be other alternatives available. Um, and, and one that I have suggested that they could explore, and it would be a great service if the state could uh, assist with this since they have notices of their own to publish. If they had a central clearinghouse online uh, for state governments, for county governments, for municipalities, uh, and an individual would just have to go to the site, scroll by their uh, city name, click on it, and have their notices available to them. It would be in the same place consistently all the time. And if they're into reading notices, they can see what's happening in the city of Baltic or, or Menno as well, too. So, but uh, right now, that's not a possibility. So I, I think, especially with technology, there are other avenues available to us uh, that are at least worth exploring. Sure. Thank you. Councilor Brecky. Well, just a, a couple words. I'm, I'm a little bit baffled. I, I know we're about to vote now on the, the final uh, resolution is amended, unless there's more amendments. But, you know, at how come we're doing this tonight, as I look at it, it's a resolution establishing the policy for the city. So that's you, Mayor, and us, the council together. And yet, as a council, as a body, we've not discussed this, except tonight when it's on the resolution for passage. So again, I would just point out, I think something like this should have been at a working session. Or at least, I, as a council member, we should have been notified, what are your legislative issues? Do you have legislative issues that you'd like to submit to the chairman or whoever you know, is participating in this process on behalf of the council? So I would just ask in the future that there should be at least one working session, um, I think, on this, you know, before it comes to the council, because it's titled City of Sioux Falls. This is our whole city is supporting this, you know, the administration and the council together. This is, these are our policies, and yet I've never seen it, you know, until it came to this meeting. And, and so, I, you know, if we have to slow it down, if we got to get out farther in front of it, I would just offer that suggestion for the future, because... You know, I'm thinking about what I might have brought to the table, and I have some some completely different issues um, that I would have liked to have had considered. You know, to to have my council members, you know, carry to that body and offer them up if if other council members had interest in it. So, I would just point that out. Um, I don't have any problem with the items that are on the on it, um, but I'm just thinking as a, as the city of Sioux Falls as a leader for these other cities that that you're working collaboratively with. Um, you know, I think there's, there's more to be gotten if we all eight work together with the mayor and the administration, and this list might be a little bit longer. But I do compliment you on the process that um, you've started this process, Christine, as you talked about your passion for it. I mean, I think you're, it's a wonderful idea that we can, you know, obviously when you work together, you're, you know, you speak a lot louder than when you work alone. So I think it's great, but I would just like to see a little more process for ourselves locally in the future. Councilor Kiley. Thank you. Um, our operations manager, Jim David, did uh, um, explain why this is before us today. Jim, would you step forward and, and provide that explanation again, please? 
Well, and, and there was an email that did go out on, on July 31st um, that just, you know, kind of provided this and if there's any changes uh, to it. Um, but there's definitely opportunities for improvement. I think, you know, your, your words are correct. And one of the uh, ideas that we're going to have to do is just begin the process with the counties and the cities much earlier uh, into May. Uh, and trying to organize that. This is two years in the making, uh, definitely opportunities for improve. Uh, and I think a working session just, you know, especially with this room now uh, ready for a working session, that it can be uh, videotaped. In fact, we'd be right over there. I think there is an opportunity for that. And we can do it again, too, in the fall, uh, where, you know, after the Municipal League has determined its policy statements, uh, we can get together at a working session and let the councilors uh, determine any additional changes, any amendments, and then move forward, and then sending that to the area local legislators. So we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Oh. Councilor Starr? Yes. Mr. Mayor, I would move to amend by striking items number 10 and 11. Okay, we have a motion by Councilor Starr to strike items 10 and 11. Second, Staley. Seconded by Councilor Staley. Discussion on that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the reason that I was moving to strike these is not necessarily that I disagree with them, but on July 24th at the Minnehaha County Commission meeting, the councilors chose not to include these two items on their legislative priority list as they move forward meeting with... Um, their county commission association. So a lot of this, I think, was built on the, the basis that they would include uh, yeah, some, item, <clears throat> excuse me, some items that don't uh, necessarily agree with county priorities, and they chose not to include these priorities. I know there were some changes later, but I was only able to watch their meeting on July 24th. Okay, uh, Councilor Erickson. Um, I'll just uh, ask for your support of not having these two removed. Um, when we did reach out to the administration and the administration did have feedback into this, um, Sam Treblecock was one that asked for number 10 to be on there. And so we had a great conversation with him about where are the funds coming from? They're all in one big pot of money and we want to see them separate them out versus just it's included, figure it out on your own. That's kind of the, the mentality that it's always been. And so I certainly want to honor the feedback that was given by the administration as well. Uh, an email was sent to them asking for their support. We've seen um, Lewis and Clark support on here from Director Cotter over the years. We've seen other um, uh, directors also give their feedback um, into certain items um, over the, like I said, over the last couple of years. And so um, I, I will tell you number 11 was one that I think is very important to keep on there. When I was in the legislature six years ago, um, we often, I, I was there voting for pine beetle, million, million dollars for the Black Hills for the pine beetle, a very worthy cause. And uh, the folks out in the hills fought like mad to try to get that money um, there to make an impact um, for the pine beetle um, infestation there. And so I would, I would think that this is great to leave it on there. Uh, there's going to be a lot of municipalities and counties that are going to need some assistance. And so if there is some funding available, I would hope that uh, we certainly have our hand out willing to accept any help we can uh, in a time that is, is going to cost the citizens a lot of money to mitigate the emerald ash or infestation. So I'd ask for you not to support the amendment. Thank you. Councilor Neitzer. Number 10 is huge for me because this is getting towards getting those agencies to step up and deal with the paratransit issue, which we are subsidizing at this point. So that's huge. I want to keep that in. So I would recommend keeping these. Councilor Kiley. And thank you, Mayor. Uh, and that's what I was going to say. The, uh, the agency trips on our paratransit system. Uh, the majority of the trips that are scheduled with paratransit are to agencies now. So number 10 is very vital to the transportation system for the city of Sioux Falls. Okay. Seeing no further discussion, I'd ask for a roll call vote on that amendment, please. Council members Brecky? No. Erickson? No. Kylie? No. Neitzer? No. Selberg? No. Sale? No. Star? No. Staley? No. That amendment fails eight to zero. So we are back to our, our amended motion. 
Uh, is there any further discussion on this topic? If not, I'd ask for a roll call vote on the amended motion as it stands. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? No. That passes seven to one. Uh, next item, item 16. A proposed resolution vacating the South Elmwood Avenue right-of-way from the <coughs> south right-of-way line of West 26th Street to the north right-of-way line of West 28th Street. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Kurt Peppel with Public Works, uh, Principal Engineer. Uh, this this right-of-way vacation is one we uh, brought forth earlier this summer. This is asking for the notice of hearing, so it will come back in September. Um, as you recall, the it's the Lifescape right-of-way vacation of Elmwood uh, near uh, Kiwanis Avenue in the VA, VA hospital to the north. Uh, Lifescape prepared and submitted the right-of-way vacation pursuant to South Dakota law and complies with the city street vacation policy. If the vacation is approved, an easement will be reserved for public and private utilities. Uh, approval of the vacation uh, will aid in the alleviating some of the on-street parking issues, uh, concerns. Uh, like I said, uh, the second reading will come back September 4th to coincide with the rezoning. Uh, engineering supports the vacation. Thanks, Kurt. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this topic? Counselors, questions for Kurt. Counselor Staley. Kurt, just for the public's benefit, uh, explain what you have to do to vacate a street. What are, I mean, as far as notifying neighbors and... Um, as, as part of the uh, city's vacation policy, um, we follow the state law process, which 100% of the adjoining owners need to sign off on it. Um, notification, we do require a neighborhood meeting to be held. Um, depending on the timing, sometimes those are held before the notice of hearing. Sometimes they're nice to be held in between. Um, in this case, it, the, the initial meeting was held back in May, I believe. And uh, typically we would provide a radius of folks that would need to be invited to that meeting. Um, and that would be the typical process, I guess. And I know we've had this discussion and they were here and I appreciate Councillor Sales' um, efforts to make this as, as beneficial for everybody as possible. Um, did you hear from neighbors on the, on the south end of this did, about the, their concerns about closing the street? Or, or should I say, what did you hear? I guess personally, I didn't hear anything. I think more of the concerns were coming into the planning office on the rezone. The rezone is, uh, and this will happen on September 4th, the rezone will happen, uh, be, be an agenda item before the right of way vacation. And so I think that most of the communication was with the planning office and not the, the towards the vacation of the street. And, and in the past, do, do you, of course, usually they're standing alone, right? This is kind of an unusual situation. Correct. Then uh, I've had conversations with citizens and the public, and we're talking about the vacation aspect that would it ever be possible to implement some kind of a fee um, so that it, I mean, because actually we're giving up a city street, which I understand really belongs to the home, the property owners on the side. That, that area was never, it was taken from property owners, right? It doesn't belong, really belong to the city. Um, it was, uh, a, at one time, uh, just imagine a cornfield or a, some sort of field out there, ag egg land. Uh, most likely this would have been one owner that would have dedicated the right of way to the city and platted the lots adjoining that. And the process that we follow is a state law process that um, essentially gives that, uh, through the vacation process, gives that <coughs> property the right-of-way back to the, to the adjoining owners. 
in this case it, it wouldn't necessarily be the owner that dedicated it but it is the adjoining owners and like I said that's a, a state law process and, and I think I wasn't on the council but I think I had heard that Councillor Erickson had asked this question in the past about if we could ever ch charge them for that land I I can't speak to that I'm did, Councilor Erickson, um, I did ask the question, and per state law, you're not re you're not allowed to do that. It's for whatever reason you're. So there's not there's not financially there's nothing that we can do to to get like a fee or a processing fee for. The, for there is a two hundred and fifty dollar fee that we charge to to process it. And can, so anybody in town, if if I happen to own this all the houses on each side of the street, I. I just happened to acquire them. I'm a landlord. Then, and I want, I decide I'm going to vacate that street and have a parking lot in between. That really is a pretty easy thing to do then. Uh, yeah, as an adjoining owner, uh, you would sign a petition uh, uh, saying that you, certifying that you own all of the properties adjoining the right of way to be vacated. And um, it would go through an engineering public works review process. And if there were no uh, substantial concerns, then it's a fairly easy process. And then you have to have six counselors vote for it, too, right? It, I think the threshold's a little higher than... I, I believe so. I would def defer to city attorney's office on that. Yeah, Paul Bankford with the city attorney's office. Uh, in, in terms of the right-of-way vacation, uh, it, it can happen, as you indicated, Councillor Staley, in terms of somebody submitting the application, but, but it is the council that makes the decision. In terms of whether that's six or, or five, I'd need, to, I'd need to look in to see uh, that. That's not something I know off the top of my head. I think Councillor Erickson is saying that that's six to make this. I mean, just, I, I'm a little on, just for the record, haven't had a, this is my first vacation. In more than one ways. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> so I'm I'm really uh, hesitant to be shutting streets off. And I think we concerning this thing seemed to kind of get away from us a little bit. It was uh, like the cat was jumped out of the bag already. But nonetheless, I'm, I'm just for the record. I'm not sure I'm going to be supporting a lot of vacations moving on. Councilor Nicer. It, just to clarify, would it be fair to say that you would be looking at things such as traffic impacts? And so if, if there was going to be a major, if, if, you, if you looked at this road and taking this one away would make these other roads have more maybe trip generation numbers than they were designed for, would that change your recommendation you would make to us as an example? Yeah, we would. It goes through a, a fairly substantial review process. Uh, our traffic office looks at all that. We actually did traffic counts out there. Uh, I don't know those exact numbers, but um, from what traffic office said, the, a majority of the folks using Elmwood are LifeScape, going to LifeScape. And um, there's not that much traffic going through there that a, a small number of those would disperse amongst the other roads. Yeah, and, and that is correct. I, I, in talking to Heath, they had done counts on all of those, and even with the projections they had done of all the traffic shifted there was still plenty of slack in the system but just I, it was more of just I just wanted to make clear that you would be looking at things like that and you wouldn't just carte blanche say sure you can vacate it because you have 100 percent of property owners nope it's it goes through issues. a pretty substantial review process okay thank you can I have a motion to set a date of hearing for September 4th at 7 p.m. for this item I'd so move moved by Councillor Second. Sale seconded by Councillor Erickson Further discussion amongst councilors? If not, a roll call vote on this, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. St Staley? Yes. That item passes 8 to 0. Uh, next item, item 17. A motion to recommend that the city retain a third-party loss control firm to provide recommendations and options of managing the risk of personal injury or death caused by falling into the Big Sioux River within Falls Park. Mayor, if I may address this, thank you very much. Well, over a period of time and consulting 
with our city attorneys as, as well as uh, individuals that were responsible for releasing the Falls Park Loss Control Special Review that came out on June 18th of this year. Um, and in doing some wordsmithing and changing things up a little bit, we finally settled on uh, the, what you have before us here because it's rather open-ended. In the loss control special review that was released, there were uh, recommendations that were made. There were actually some recommendations that were considered and then rejected, and then there were other recommendations one of which we've enacted, and that's the viewing platform along the, the Lower Falls area. In addition to that, there were recommendations for additional signage, a third party risk assessment, looking at the possible removal of the Lowhead Dam, and as well as incorporating technology uh, as it may relate to this particular issue. And so uh, I, even, even though uh, Falls Park is reviewed annually, and I have all the faith in our safety specialists, in our risk management personnel. I think it's at a point in time where it is um, prudent to have a fresh set of eyes take a look at Falls Park and um, specifically measures uh, that are already existing or could be put in place that mitigates the chance of indi individuals falling uh, into the Big Sioux River with, within Falls Park area. Uh, originally we had, with the, while on the rocks, and then um, uh, I requested that we remove that because obviously there's other places you can get in trouble besides on the rocks too, but yet wanted it to focus on the risk of personal injury or death caused by falling into the river. We didn't want to get into reviewing the number of cracks and p potential tow trips in the sidewalks or the height uh, and width of the treads on the stairs. We wanted to focus on the issue at hand. And, and Falls Park uh, is an attractive um, tourist destination and it, and it draws thousands of people uh, every year and unfortunately part of that attraction involves natural conditions that can be dangerous. And so, once again, um, I think it's a prudent thing for us to just have another fresh set of eyes, take a look at it, to assure that we are doing everything that we, that we can. And the uh, recommendation goes forward uh, to the administration, and it will be up to them. In fact, the recommendation contained in the review contained recommendations as to who you could employ uh, to conduct this. And there's a board of certified safety professionals. I would just recommend at the minimum that would include somebody who is board certified. And there were other uh, con um, suggestions within the review that could be followed up as well too. So, and I, I will defer now to Councillor Sale as well. Thank you, Councillor Kiley. Councillor Sale. Well, I concur with uh, everything that Councillor Kiley has said. Mr. Mayor, uh, we, we should start with the motion. I we haven't heard the motion. No. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to adopt this resolution. Okay, there's a motion by Councillor Sale to adopt this resolution. But I don't, I don't know where the motion is. Because it wasn't, it's not on sire, and there's a, a description of what it is, but if that's the actual motion. This is, it's in a motion, what's called a motion form. It is not a um, ordinance. It, it is um, uh, also not a resolution. We discussed the possibility of putting it in resolution form or ordinance form. The advantage of doing a, making this a motion is that it can be enacted immediately. The administration could act on it tomorrow. In fact, I would hope that you do. Uh, because I would like to have the study conducted so that any recommendations could then be in place already by spring of 2019. So that's the reason it's in a motion form. We don't see these very frequently. But. Thank you, Councillor Kiley. Councillor Starr. No, no, does no that, that's does that answer, answer your yeah, question. Yeah, I'm just I'm trying to make sure that this is the actual motion, so that's why when it. It, it wasn't read or stated other than Sure. There's a motion. So I was making sure that this was a specific wording. So there is a, 
a motion by Councillor Sale on the table to approve this item, and can I get a second for that? Second. Seconded by Councillor Kiley. Uh, I also want to make sure we give the public the opportunity to comment on this, if there's any public input. All right, seeing none, discussion amongst the Council on this. Councillor Kiley. If I'd just like to add, too, uh, I'm not alone in this. Councillor Staley and Councillor Starr, they have also voiced support over time for this as well, and that, and that I hope that uh, we can garner the support of all of the members of the council. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Starr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to move to amend by inserting the words following false part not to exceed $10,000. All right, there's a motion on the floor to uh, amend this motion with not to exceed $10,000 as uh, the final sentence of this motion. Do I have a second of support for that? Second. Seconded by Councillor Staley. Discussion on that, Councillor yes, Starr. It, it, it's not a number I pulled out of the air. Councillor Staley and I did uh, meet with uh, Attorney Fifely from the risk pool, and it was a number that he stated to us that it should this should be able to be accomplished for less than ten thousand dollars. So I didn't think of it until just a few minutes ago when this came on the agenda, or I would have tossed it out sooner. But um, with his recommendation and, and his statement, that I think that'd be a, a good place for us to start. Thank you, Councilor Councilor Kiley. Thank you. Um, this is technically a recommendation going forward. The administration could ignore it, although I have absolutely no reason to think that they would. If we start stipulating money, uh, an amount, then in my mind, the recommendation stops being a, a recommendation. Um, and, I, and, and tried very hard not to put limits on what the study could do for us as well and what it could include. Um, I too have had discussions and I've been told, I was told that it should be able to be done within a $15,000 amount. Um, and, I, and I think that is something that the administration can consider too when they elect to move forward with this to, to keep it within that ten dollars to $15,000 range. I'm not certain that it needs to be uh, in the motion. Thank you, Councilor Kiley. Councilor Sale. Uh, Councilor Starr, I appreciate you reaching out to the past city attorney for that recommendation, but he is the past city attorney, and we have the possibility of having a new city attorney very shortly, and I would recommend, I would hope that uh, let's take him out for a spin. Let's see what he can do. Uh, let's give him this chance to, to lead this charge and how much, let's not hamstring him with this. If we, through this discussion, I believe the administration has a pretty strong understanding where the council comes from. Let's uh, give them a little rope. Let's see what they do. We can always pull it back if we need to. So I am going to vote against the amendment and for the original motion. Councilor Staley. Well, and just for clarification, we sought out David Fifely, not as a former city attorney, but because he was the head of the Insurance Alliance. So we went right to him because they're, they're the ones who are handling the risk moving forward. We thought he would be the appropriate person just to talk about what what could be done. So it it wasn't an attorney kind of a request. Do you understand it? And and he also he was talking about I would hope we would involve him because he has access to experts in the field to come in. He thought you know having an independent set of eyes from me even out of town would be good. But he said we, he thought we could get this thing done. And this is before I knew that, that Councillor Kiley was, was doing this. Um, but get it done for single digits. So I think our mayor is hearing the conversation. He understands that uh, we, we don't want to spend a lot of you know money. We're spending $300,000 for the platform. And, um, but I, I support that you guys are doing this. Uh, I think it's it's very important to just get as much information as we possibly can. Thank you. Councilor Brecky. I won't be supporting the amendment because I, I want to give the uh, 
administration the flexibility to do the to, to do the right thing. You're going to study it. You you've got permission, the authority, the support of the council to do it. So let's you know let's not limit the money. Let's um, define what the project is you want and get it done right. And I think ultimately we probably will still have to approve a contract. So you know certainly we'll have an opportunity to do that. But um, if not, I'm just I'm comfortable with you know giving that authority to the mayor. And I, I don't, you know, I don't want to be haggling over a thousand dollars here, a thousand dollars there. What if it's sixteen? What if it's eighteen? Um, if we're going to do this, let's have a good look taken out there and find out what those risks are so that we can address them. Thank you, Councilor Brecky. Councilor Kiley. And and I thank Councilor Brecky for those comments. And and again, I, I hate to put limitations on it. No, I'm not interested in spending money unnecessarily. However, at the same time, this is a an important topic. And I'd hate to see anything limited because of, we put a limitation on the funding available. Mm -hmm. So uh, I feel comfortable, uh, as Councillor Sales stated, with, with the original motion as is. And further discussion on this? If not, I need a vote on the amendment to add not to exceed 10000 to this uh, motion. Council Members Brecky? No. Erickson? No. Kiley? No. Neitzer? No. Selberg? No. Sale? No. Star? Yes. Staley? No. That amendment fails seven to one. And so we have the uh, original motion to approve on the table. Is there further discussion on that? Councilor Neitzer? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say for my part, I wasn't, you know, I, I, I'm not entirely sure whether or not this is necessary. However, I greatly appreciate that this was done in a way that gives the administration a lot of latitude. This is really well done for them to try to figure out what is best and it's not necessarily a dictator. You will do this for this much particular money. So um, I, I will uh, support it with just that little bit of reservation, but I would say well done in, in crafting it, in working with the administration to come up with something that hopefully everybody is okay with. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Selberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I too would probably concur with a lot of those words, but I appreciate Councillor Sale and Councillor Kiley's efforts in, again, being thorough with this, their work they've done with this, and how it's been drafted to, again, give some leeway and find a, find a hopefully a conclusion here as we move along. So nice work. Seeing no further discussion, I'd ask for a motion to uh, approve this. And a roll call vote, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. That item passes 8 to 0. Uh, Councillors, is there any additional new business to discuss? Okay. Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Move to adjourn by Kiley, seconded by Councillor Erickson. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed, no. Motion is carried. This meeting is adjourned. Have a good night.